Chris Newcomb. And in this episode of Thanks for Thinking, I'm going to show you a clip from a storytelling uh, gig that I did recently with uh, uh, Tall Tales Live. It's uh, part of Portland, New Hampshire television. And uh, so I'm going to show you a clip of that story. It's called Hi, Chris. And uh, it's a true story that I tell. And uh, it's one of those stories that most people won't believe. But uh, if you've been feeling kind of down and out and lonely and feeling invisible or maybe abandoned by life, this is a story for you. I hope you enjoy. I'm Amy Antonucci, and I'm happy to be welcoming you to our True Tales Live Zoom show on November 24th, 2020. It's our last show of the year. Thanks to everyone watching and listening, and especially to those who are here in our live online audience. Next up, we have Chris Newcomb from Portland, Maine. He's a storyteller who's been writing and telling tales for a long time. Recently, he retired from 30 years of teaching gifted and talented students in Maine public schools. Besides writing and telling stories whenever and wherever he can, Chris operates an art studio where he makes steel sculptures. I'd like to see some of those sometime, Chris. Every day, each of us must decide how to respond to what life brings or throws at us. No matter how privileged or underprivileged we may be, we still wrestle with the same demons and hope for the same joys. Chris's story tonight is a true tale about being seen at a time when his world had collapsed into a dark, lonely place where he felt abandoned by life. Its title is, Hi, Chris. Or, Hi, Chris. All right, Chris. Thanks. Come on. Thank you. So uh, when I was a kid, I, both, both of my parents were serious alcoholics. I mean, serious, they, they didn't stop drinking for, my father never stopped drinking his entire life. And uh, he basically abandoned my brothers and I and my mom, our whole family, he abandoned us to alcohol. That was a choice that he made. And uh, he never once, my, my mom finally left him and he never once visited us. He never gave a gift. He never gave a penny in alimony. I mean, he just, what he gave was he put his time into alcohol. He was willing to, he always had money for alcohol. It's amazing. My mom was also a ravage. I mean, she was a serious drunk as well, but she finally found AA and stopped drinking. And she hasn't had a drink in over 60 years. And it was wonderful um, that she did that. And I'm thankful and it saved her life and it saved our life. However, the truth was that she abandoned us to her recovery. And so we never saw her. She was at meeting after meeting, night after night after night. And that went on for years. Um, and so, but this is not a story about how awful my parents were because they both were good people and they did the best they could with the resources they had. And my mom at 97 right now, she adores me and she would do anything for me. But it's a story about being a child and not being seen and being abandoned in that kind of a life. And as you grow up, there's just this part of you that can't, you just need to be seen, you feel invisible. And if you're lucky enough and you're great at sports, you can be seen. And if you're good at uh, academics, you could be seen. Or if you're great at theater, you could be seen. I just didn't happen to be good at any of those things. I wasn't seen and felt just totally invisible. And it wasn't until I was about in my forties that this began to take a change. And one, it was a spring morning, it was April, and I woke up and the abandonment, the loneliness, the invisibility was just, I woke up with that just over my shoulder, it was horrible. And uh, I decided to go out to the beach. And on the way to the beach, I thought, you know, what, what is it I need? And I realized all I really need is just to be seen. I just, I just wish the universe would say like, you know, hi, Chris, you know, I see you. And, uh, and that really was all I wanted just to be seen, to be, to be seen. So it was like, kind of like, yeah, I want the universe to say, hi, Chris. 
And I thought it was silly, but at the same time, that's what I wanted. So anyway, I head out to Scarborough Beach. And uh, these are the days when you could go early in the morning. There were no gates. There were no locks. There were none of that kind of stuff. And so I drove in. It was probably 5.30 in the morning, something like that. And as I'm walking up the pathway to the dunes, I realized suddenly exactly what I wanted. I wanted to find a completely whole sand dollar. And, uh, you know, there were sand dollars on the beach all the time, but I had never found a completely whole one. So I just started running and I ran up the path and I ran down under the beach and I'm just running and running. I'm not looking at the sand. I'm just running and I jump in the air. I spread my legs. I land with a thud on the sand and right between my feet is a perfectly round, whole, white sand dollar. <laughs> you know, pretty cool. But Doubting Thomas that I am, I think I'm at a beach. <laughs> you know, there's sand dollars here. And yes, that's cool. I've never found one. And this is a pretty strange way to find them. But yeah. And then I thought about the yin and yang of life. And I thought, well, you know, if there's a white sand dollar, why isn't there a black sand dollar? So I thought, that's it. I want to find a perfectly whole round black sand dollar. I didn't know if they existed. I turned and I started running up the beach. And again, I just ran. I ran. I didn't look at the beach. I just ran. And at some point, I jumped in the air. I spread my legs, boom, I land with a thud, and I'm telling you the truth. Between my feet was a perfectly whole, round, black sand dollar. You'd think I'd be overjoyed. <laughs> I'd be like, this was it, wow, you know, this, and it was cool, it was wonderful, but there was still part of me, that thought, it's a beach, you know, and I, I don't know, and I was, I was glad, I felt better than I did when I started the day, but eh, still wasn't enough. So, I head into town and I go into Falmouth and I stop at a Rite Aid. And I can't remember what I was buying, but whatever I bought, I bought um, with a check. And so I'd written the check with this pen that I had and it's a pen that I have to draw with and, and to write with. And it's just one, it wasn't an expensive pen, it was like $1.98, but you could, there was something about it. It was a felt tip pen, fine point, and you could draw as fast as you wanted or write as fast as you wanted and it would keep up with you. And that was a really hard find. And so I really loved this pen. Anyway, I, I get done, I write the check and I'm looking around for the cap for the pen and I can't find it. And I look on the you know, conveyor belt, it's not there. I look at all the candy, I look down, nothing. I check my pockets, no pen cap. Well, I can't really keep the pen because it's felt tip. If I put it in my pocket, it'll bleed into the fabric. It's gonna dry up you know, without the pen cap. So I go outside and I see a trash can. It's early morning. I, you know, It's one of those trash cans that has the round lid with the little thing and I push the thing open and I drop the pen cap, I mean the, the pen into the trash can. And I go over to a hardware store and I buy something there. And I remember I paid with cash and I'm looking in my pocket for change and lo and behold, <laughs> there's the pen cap. You know, and I know I had checked that pocket, but you know how that goes. I checked everywhere and still didn't see it. Anyway, I find my pen cap and I'm really excited. Oh, yay, this is great. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I threw my pen away, but it's early morning, you know, there won't be much trash. So I go over to the trash can and I lift that lid up and I look inside and it was early morning. There was coffee and donuts and cream cheese and all kinds of morning sticky trash in the trash can. But I looked down in there and there was a white styrofoam cup and it was completely dry and inside of it was my pen. So I pull the thing out and when I pull the cup out, there written in blue ballpoint ink on the side of that styrofoam cup are the words, hi. Chris. Now, I know <clears throat> that somebody else named Chris was given a cup of coffee that morning, but that Chris dropped that cup into that trash can, unbeknownst that I would pick it up. And somehow the universe got me to pick that dang thing up. So that morning I'm feeling, I want to be seen. I want, hey, universe, say hi. And it did. Hi, Chris. And I got a black sand dollar, a white sand dollar. I got my pen back and I also cap back and I also got the universe to say, hi, Chris. It's amazing. Now, do I believe that most of you will believe this story? Absolutely not. People find this too far fetched to believe. But if one person hears this, it inspires them. If they feel abandoned, if they feel lonely, I hope that maybe this will encourage them. Because all I know is from that day forward, I've never been able to say I haven't been seen. Thanks. Oh, that's great, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> um, I believe, I believe. <laughs> and uh, in your bio, 
you note that you make steel sculptures, uh, some of which I saw on your website, <clears throat> and uh, really very nice. And uh, I should be asking you a storytelling question, but in an alternate universe, I'm a really excellent steel welder and a garden art sculptor. So I wondered if you could share with us some of your ideas about storytelling and sculpture. Well, that's that's awesome. I want to go touch on something Amy said. Uh, you know, the thing I realized a long time ago was that logic does not work for people. We know logically, for example, we know we shouldn't smoke, but how many millions and millions and millions of people smoke? And they know better. But it's it's the heart where we move, and that's what changes things. And the arts are all about reaching into the heart. And that's why storytelling, the visual arts, the performing arts, all of that is what, that really is what moves people, not logic. Um, so, and as an artist, uh, as a storyteller, but also as a visual artist, one of the things, <laughs> the work that I've been doing the last few years is a series that, that I call Aliens. And there, I wish I had a picture to show you right now, um, but they're, uh, they're just sort of these odd creatures. They're about five feet tall. And I usually did my steel work uh, as, um, well, let me see. What have I got here that I can show you uh, without tearing it out the wall? Um, oh, well. Um, well. Let me see if you can see this. Oops. Can you see this little guy here, that figure? So that's oh, that was a little figure, sort of a hieroglyphic kind of image that I was doing um, with printmaking. And then I started getting involved in steel. I thought, wouldn't it be cool to make these things five or six feet tall, put them in the yard? And uh, anyway, I fell absolutely in love with the whole process of uh, working in steel. And um, so I started making these things, but then about four years ago, something that happened that made me feel like I was an alien in my own country. And I realized that that's I just nothing. I woke up one morning in November, four years ago, and realized what's going on here. I mean, so I started making these aliens and they're just kind of representation of you know, how I felt. And what's been really interesting, I, I started to work with color for the first time with steel because I did everything with steel and let it just rust. But I started working with bright, bright colors and people have responded so favorably to them. And uh, I've got some on the Portland trails. They've put them on the trails, which are really cool. Um, and anyway, it's just been really fun to do that. But again, it's a way that I can visually, I can say something visually um, as well as it's another way of telling a story. Well, well said. Thank <laughs> you.